Here it is, five parts. Part number one, we have got to win the, the hearts and minds of young Americans, period. We have to win their hearts and minds. How do we do that? Well, we have to give them stuff that makes telling the story of freedom cool and interesting and fun. We have to hand them hand grenades. We have to give them the tools to convince other people. I've had a chance to work with young conservatives now for I don't know. The last several months, certainly, I've been doing nothing but colleges and high schools. These kids are outnumbered 10 to 1, 20 to 1. They're physically intimidated. They're physically threatened. There are young conservatives in colleges now with conservative Republicans, Young Americans for Freedom, Turning Point. These kids have got tremendous courage. Tremendous, tremendous courage. But to give you an example of what I'm talking about, I went to a Turning Point USA event, and everybody was wearing a pin that says, I heart capitalism. And they're wearing it on campus. And good for them, because that requires courage. But my point is, they have a button that says, I heart capitalism. And if somebody comes up to them and says, well, why do you love capitalism? What are they going to say? Why? They know it's good. They don't know how to explain why it's good. So we're going to start to, con to conceptualize some of these things. I'm going to be doing some young videos, uh, people for young people, as well as the firewalls. And I'm going to talk about economics. These first five videos are going to be on economics because if you look at young people, they make a decision to become so-called socialists because they don't understand anything, anything about how economies actually work. And when I say I'm going to talk about econo economics, I'm not talking about high-level economics. I'm going to do a video on money. What is money? What's money? Everybody can identify money, but nobody knows what it is. Every now and then somebody will say, well, money is a unit of exchange. Perfect example. That's exactly right. It's a unit of exchange. A unit of exchange of what? What? What are we exchanging when we buy something? Well, it turns out we're exchanging quality and value, but these are the kind of questions that they've never heard before, and when I go to young people, when they, when they hear me talking about these things, their reaction's not one of hate. They just gasp and look at each other like, can you believe this guy just said that? The opportunities are amazing. You do not understand how thin this wide vein of socialism is, how thin it is. I've never met a progressive I couldn't flip in 15 minutes. But with 80 million of them, I don't really have that kind of time. <laughs> so what do we do? We have to understand how viral systems work, which means that up here at the top of the information pyramid, we have to create very simple, very compelling arguments why capitalism is good, why America is good, why this works. We have to give it to young Republicans so that they can convert other young Republicans. And then those young Republicans start converting moderates. And then it's all over. We win. We win. Our story is much better than theirs is, but we have to understand that we have to get young people the ammunition they need to start this process of 40 years of recovering the country. If you wondered why somebody as awful and evil as Hillary Clinton could become a major party's nominee, it's because the American people are so morally corrupt that it doesn't bother them anymore. If we don't understand that this starts at the grassroots and grows up, we're going to lose. There's not going to be a politician that's going to save us. We have to fix the fundamentals. So number one, we've got to get to young people with a message that they like, that's understandable, and in their own language. That's number one. Second thing we have to do is we have to get back into the pop culture. I know a lot of people think that the pop culture is one of many battlefields, but it's not. You'll often hear people talking about movies or TV or we need to get into that like it's another battlefield like politics, but it's not. The pop culture is the, is the ocean that all of these other fish swim in. And we cannot expect the American people to follow us if we can't speak their language. I had a friend who said something very, very provocative. It really made me angry, but he was right. He said, you know, Barack Obama is really more American than Mitt Romney is. Oh, come on. No, he is. Barack Obama's been on Ellen. Barack Obama's downloaded songs from iTunes. Barack Obama knows a Simpsons reference. Barack Obama can talk about The Walking Dead. Barack Obama speaks the language of the people. And so, we need to get into the pop culture. And our problem is, when we try to do movies or TV or music, we try to make conservative movies or TV or music. And that's not how it works. We have to make excellent and interesting and cool music and TV and music that happens to be made by conservatives. If you look back at the early to mid-1960s, Hollywood, which belonged to us then, was a conservative institution. Hollywood was making films like Seven Brides for Seven Brothers and Paint Your Wagon and all this milquetoast nonsense, and the left comes out with a film like Easy Rider.
Is Easy Rider about the benefits of socialism? No. No, Easy Rider was interesting and different and cool, but Easy Rider showed us a dark America, and it showed us an evil America, and people went to see it by the millions, and they said, this is really cool, and they started absorbing all of those values the way that the pop culture will put values into your head. So we cannot make the Ronald Reagan story because nobody will listen to that. We have to make interesting movies about vampires and space aliens and all the rest that are made by conservatives that don't speak a word of politics, but they use things like they have their own weapons, they have their own cars, they're trying to stop this overpressing government, so on. We've got to get back in the pop culture, and if we can smell politics in the products we put out, then we have failed. It's got to be absolutely invisible the way that the values of the left are invisibly implicated, uh, implanted in the minds of our kids. That's number two. Number three is we have to outflank the mainstream news media. We just have to. Now, many of you have said and asked me and talked to each other about how do we change the news media. We do not change the news media. This is the most corrupt institution morally in the United States. We, it is. They are the most ideologically left-wing organization in the country. The, muse, the news media today is the publicity department for the progressive movement. And if you think you're going to change them, you're wrong. Now, I said I'd flank them. I didn't say change them. The good news here is that we do not have to defeat the mainstream news media because the mainstream news media is dying right in front of our eyes. It's just rolling over and dying right in front of our eyes. So if we're going to have a plan that wins, we ought to look at our advantages as well as our disadvantages. And one of our advantages is that young people don't watch CNN, and they certainly don't read the New York Times. I'm not sure they can read it all, to be honest with you. But they're not reading the Times, and they're not reading Time Magazine, and they're not watching CNN or MSNBC. They're not watching any of this. People under 30 are getting their news from YouTube. They're getting news from Facebook, from Instagram. You may not like it, but it's true. They're getting their news from social media. That's wonderful for us, because we can play in social media. We can make connections in social media. We don't need to spend billions of dollars to buy network television. We just have to make a, more of a presence where we are. And the more young people that start speaking a conservative message from point one, the more of these voices we're going to hear. We should have thousands and thousands of YouTube channels for people who are conservatives, people who are old men, young women, gay men. Everybody should be telling their story of what freedom means to me so that instead of me telling somebody something a hundred times, a hundred people tell that person something once. Much more effective. So the news media is dying. And the reason we can say this is because everybody remembers the, the video of Hillary staggering into the car on 9-11, right? When she collapsed into the van. It's a perfect example. The mainstream news media said that she misstepped, that she stumbled. No, she collapsed. How do we know that she collapsed? Did we see it on CNN? No, because CNN didn't have cameras there. And if CNN had had cameras there, we never would have seen it anyway. They just would have sat on it. We know that Hillary Clinton was at the point of collapse because two private citizens had their cell phones on them and shot video that was uploaded to the internet before any network even knew that there was something going on. My friends, we live in a country now, we live in a world where 180 million Americans carry high-definition television cameras in their pockets at any given time. In the time it takes CNN to get a crew together, put them in a van, get them down to the spot, get the lights up and the guy with the microphone, it's over, it's done. It's not only over and done, but millions of people have already seen it live streamed in time, real time, to the internet because of these things. We do not have to replace the news media. The news media is going away. We have 180 million citizen journalists. We don't need to recruit them. We don't need to organize them. The signal is getting out. And this is why Hillary Clinton lost the election. She actually thought that she could keep secrets in this age. And it's just not going to happen anymore. So the news media is gone, and we are going to take its place one way or another. Number four is very controversial, but I deal with a lot of people out there in the real world, and I know what Americans are hungry for. I think Donald Trump reflects this attitude. Number four is we need a new kind of politician. And please, please pay attention that I did not say we need a new politician. We need new kinds of politicians. We keep waiting for where's our next Reagan? Is Rubio our next Reagan? Is it going to be Ted Cruz? No, this is a top-down answer to a bottom-up problem. It doesn't matter. Ronald Reagan could rise from the dead today. He'd still be looking good, by the way. He'd looking, be looking better than Hillary, certainly. And he could get up on this podium and say exactly what he said in the 1980s, and it wouldn't have any effect. 
because it's not those times anymore. Young people have been socialized from the time they're four or five years old. So we need something dramatic, and we need a new kind of politician. Now, obviously, this is my personal opinion, but if I wanted to win the votes of every American for the rest of time, I would say, here's my political party. My party has essentially one platform, and the platform that our party has is no re-election to the same office, period. What? No re-election. What do you mean? I mean, if we elect a representative, he goes to Washington, he does two years, he comes home. That's not politics. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because we need to find people of a special brand. We need a new kind of politician. We need to be able to interview people and say, would you like our endorsement for the US Senate? And they go, we sure would. You don't have the job. You're not, not who we're interested in. We need to find politicians who look at two years or four years or six years in Washington the way that you would look at as a two-year jury duty that you couldn't get out of. It's your social obligation, and you can't get out of it. The people we need in Washington, not just Republicans either, we need people who say, I can't go to Washington. I can't go to Washington for two years. I've got a family. I've got a business to run. I can't just leave and go. Those people will change Washington because they won't be politicians. They'll be citizens who happen to be in the legislature for a period of time, and that is how this republic was meant to be. We have got to destroy this priesthood that lives in Washington and has become so elite and so centralized that they just love to tell us what to do. There are a couple of benefits to this in terms of selling the American people. First of all, we can say, you want to get money out of politics? In our party, there is no money in politics. Why? Because money is used to influence politicians for the re-election. We're not getting re-elected. Next question. We're free of corruption. We're free of influence. Our guys go back home. But the main point we can say is this. We can say, listen, we believe in this because we think, we Republicans think, that with 320 million people, we should be able to find 525 representatives, 100 senators, and 50 governors who aren't complete idiots. If we can't find that number of people in 320 million people, we don't deserve to govern ourselves. We don't deserve it. People say, well, the bureaucracy will change this. Well, the bureaucracy determines how things are done. If I was a representative and one of my bureaucrats said, well, uh, Mr. Whittle, that's not how things are done around here. You see, here's the way Washington works. I would say, let's stop right here. I represent 450,000 people from the second congressional district in California. You don't represent anybody. I'm the voice of the people. You're a hired bureaucrat. You're not going to tell me how things work in Washington. I'm going to tell you how things work in Washington. And the first thing that's going to happen in Washington is you're fired. <laughs> that's how it's done. That's how it's done when politics is not your life. When you have a home to go back to, you can make these kind of statements because you genuinely don't care. You're not in it for the jets and the golf courses and the honorable this and the... No. It's duty. You go to Washington, you come back and do your, do your stuff. If you tell that to the American people, they're going to vote you in in overwhelming numbers. Now, the fifth point is the most controversial point, and it's also the most important point. This is especially tough for people to understand after we've been at such incredible state of warfare for so long now. But the fifth, final, and most important point is this. We have got to steal the progressives' weapons. We've got to steal their weapons. Sun Tzu said that the ultimate form of warrior is swordlessness. Swordlessness is the ability of a warrior to walk unarmed into the enemy camp and kill them all using their weapons. What does this mean? It means that as long as there's somebody protesting in the streets of Ferguson with their fist in the air, talking about Black Lives Matter, if we don't have a plan for that person, then somebody else will. And they will continue to use that hardship, they'll continue to use that sadness, all of that empathy will be used for the continuing control of those populations. We have to go in there and set those people free. We don't like rioting in the streets of a major American city, and we don't like to admit this, but these are Americans, these are our fellow citizens, and they've been living under progressive tyranny for a hundred years. We have to have a plan to go in there and help those people be free, and if we don't, somebody else will take that audience and we will continue to lose. We have to have a plan for all Americans. Freedom works for everybody or it doesn't work at all. And if we understand this, if we understand that we have to reach everybody in the country, then there won't be any reason for progressives anymore. Progressives have the power that they have and growing power with young people because we're perceived as we just don't care. And to be honest with you, we've walked away from a lot of these issues. We cannot walk away from them. We have to have a better solution for them. Donald Trump started to do this. He went to black, college, uh, black churches, and it made a big difference. So we have to be prepared to do this. We have to be prepared to help everybody, not with a big government program, but just to show them what freedom is. 
We have to show them why freedom is better than their current slavery.